Welcome to the next presentation on balances as guides towards a sustainable future. Last time we have seen what is available, how much reserves we have and how we are using them. Today we would want to try to start to dare to look a little bit ahead. And I should be very careful about what I'm saying because what we are trying to do is not really predictions but rather projections. Projections meaning we think how we can develop into the future and there are different scenarios to be taken into account. Of course, it is such that always these projections are uh, rather vague. It is simply because human behavior can change dramatically. If somebody important says something, it can change the whole world. War can break out. Economic crisis, crisis can occur. Somebody can say, well, our nutrition is completely wrong, things have to change completely. And if that is somebody who is regarded highly, then people will follow that. So there can be significant changes if individual people do certain individual things. And because that is so, there is a wide variety of options for our future that can happen. On the other hand, that means we can change something. Every single person of us can change something if we know the basis. And the presentations I want to give is actually about this basis, the basic understanding of how things interrelate. Now today we would like to, or now we would like to look where we want to, where we are going from now. And we want to look at that for fossil energy carriers, world population and the standard of living. And try to do some projections about that, with all the care that is possibly required and that is possible. And how we want to proceed is, that we finally want to use what we have learned in the chapter on balances. We know how to set up balances and now we want to use them. We know how much fossil energy carriers we have, we know how much we are using per year. Why don't we do anything with these numbers? The balances that we want to set up are for the entire world, for well, Earth of course, if I say world, so for the entire Earth. And in the course of the presentations, we want to look at different balances for different regions, so to speak. The first balance we want to set up is for the lithosphere. This is this yellowish or orange uh, balance volume. So this is the balance boundary encycling the entire rocky part of the Earth, sea as included possibly as well. And this contains also uh, all the fossil energy carriers that we have available. The second balance you want to look at later on, land area for example, is part of that, is the biosphere. And the third one is the atmosphere surrounding all that. Now what we are doing with our fossil energy carriers is that we, well, they are contained in the lithosphere. We are mining them and burning them. And of course what we are mining is taken out of the lithosphere. So if we set up the balance for the lithosphere and look what's happening inside, so that's a change in a given reserve, then there's a certain mining rate. We mine a certain amount of tons per year, for example. And the change is now formally written, well, what is entering? Nothing is entering. We don't put any coal or oil back into the, into the earth. We don't do that, at least not in any significant amounts. But we take something out, something is leaving, is crossing the uh, boundary from the inside to the outside and that's exactly the mining rate at which we are producing the fossil or extracting the fossil energy carriers from the ground. So it's minus the mining. Plus what is occurring inside, what is produced inside, hmm, the production rate of fossil energy carriers is extremely slow, millions of years to produce that. So if we, can, if we, can, if we can forget that, it's comparably small, we know that, that it's comparably small as compared to the mining rate. And what is disappearing, well there is something disappearing actually in China for example there is a, a quite some a coal mines burning underground and you cannot extinguish the uh, fire so they are continuing to burn. And of course that reduces the reserves that we have, it's disappearing so to speak. We don't have anything, we don't take that out across the border, we don't mine it so to speak. But of course 
This again is a relatively small fraction of the overall reserves that we have and it's also compared, uh, co comparably small as compared to the mining rate. So as a good approximation we can say the change in the reserves is minus that what we are mining. Okay, now what can we do with that? We can define something and can ask questions. We know the reserves and we know that per year we are changing the re reserves by exactly what we are mining. Now the question is how long do the re reserves last? So let's make an assumption first. Well, this is what I've just said before and taken from the previous slide. The balance reads for the energy carriers, primary energy carriers reads like that. The change of the re reserves is minus that what we are mining. And the assumption we want to now to make is that the mining rate will be constant in the future. Of course it is not correct. We will look at that in a little bit more detail in the following slides, but let's for the first assumption let's look, or for first guess, let's look at a constant mining rate. Then we can ask ourselves how long do we have to proceed with this mining rate for each individual fossil energy carrier so that the reserves will be used up. So in the end we will have zero remaining. And we achieve that if we define it like this, the reserves that we have today, minus what we are producing, uh, what we are mining through the entire time with a constant annual mining rate should be zero. And the time it takes to use up the reserves is called static reach. Static reach means how long will it take with a constant mining rate until we have used up the reserves. So that's a static reach and that is this more or less re read from the balances, uh, the definition of the static reach. Now we can solve this equation Static reach is the reserves, reserves by, uh, divided by the annual mining rate. Uh, you might have guessed that directly, possibly, because it's so simple. But anyway, I try to relate that to the balances that we want to set up. Now we can evaluate the reserves that we have seen in the last video divided by the annual mining rate. We have also seen in the last video, if we take the numbers, we wind up with these values. Crude oil will last for 55 years, natural gas for 65 years, and coal for 120, uh, 112 years. So coal will more or less last long enough so that we don't have to bother about that. The others, well, 55 years, I won't see that anymore, but many of you will presumably uh, still live there and will see when the, we are running out of crude oil, possibly. Well, now of course um, this is a model that we have used. Models always can have errors and I will just discuss a little bit about potential errors that a model may have. This is given on this slide, model inaccuracies. On the one hand side the parameters may be uncertain. For example a parameter is in the model we have used the annual mining rate. Some nations don't specify exact values of their mining rate. The reserves, which is essentially also a parameter in the model, is also not exactly known. Well, the countries tell how much they have, but there's lots of discussion how accurate these data really are. On the other hand side, you may have model uncertainties. Now, model uncertainties with the simple balances hardly occur. Now, you can neglect some flow rate, some rate of extraction, some rate of whatever, and that can be wrong. With just looking at something which is there and taking something away, uh, the model doesn't have so many uncertainties. We will see later on models that are uncertain. Yeah, we will see that, but for the current issue it's not really relevant. Um, then we have, one, have to, one has to uh, look a little bit at the uncertainty as I specified it, as I just as used the word uncertainty, one has to think a little bit what does it mean. Uncertainty means I know in principle what is going on and I know there is a certain scatter of the data. I know that the parameters have a certain well, variability. If I ask again next year that may be a different value. If I look more carefully it may be slightly different. This is uncertainty. I usually have at least a certain possibility to guess about the uncertainty. Another point is a so-called ignorance. Ignorance means that I simply don't know. I just left out certain aspects that are there in reality 
but, but which I'm not aware of. So I can't apply models describing that. I'm simply ignorant of all the effects of this, if, uh, this point may have. And the last point, which is sometimes used, is the so-called risk. Risk means what, well, in general terms, we say what is at risk, so to speak, what is the risk of something. And if you want to use risk, you, one usually defines it as a probability that, that something negative happens times the amount that we have to pay for that this event occurs. So it's the probability times the amount of money or of life or whatever that defines the risk of some event. Okay, and this just sets a frame, so to speak, and I will refer especially to uncertainty and ignorance some times later on in these presentations. So I said model uncertainties for balances themselves are hardly available or can hardly occur. But, of course, the different contributions for setting up and solving the balances, they can have uncertainties. And, well, if we sit back and look a little bit at those things that we have assumed, we have assumed that the mining rate is constant, and if we look simply at historical data, we see that is not so. And there are, of course, several reasons why this assumption is not correct and why we have to model differently why we have to modify our model in order to describe the reality better. So the balance itself, it's clear, but the contributions, as I said already on the chapter on balances, the contributions, there you can make significant errors, of course. One thing that we have to look at is that, of course, world population is increasing. And it's not only increasing in such historical dimensions as shown here, just, just to visualize that a little bit, but population is increasing also today. And for today we have actually, on the one hand side, the historical data, the world population in billion versus the time. And we see that population has been increasing quite significantly. This is when I have been born. This is where we are today, roughly. And we have seen that since I have been born, the um, world population has more than doubled. So when I was born, I had double that much land area available, for example. Yeah, you, well, perhaps not you, but you have to calculate how many people were, were there on this earth when you have, born, ha have been born. So at that time also larger land areas were available. So the world is getting crowded. And there are different projections now from now onward into the future, given by the United Nations. They have a population scenario group, so to speak, and they update their data and calculate how the world population will develop in the future. And we see that actually one of the that this is actually one of the big problems, that the world population is increasing because if the Earth gets more crowded, the resources that we have available are being reduced because we have to share among more people on this globe. And so we would like to have actually a development towards the future which levels off, so to speak, and levels off at a value which is feasible, yeah, which the Earth really can stand, so to speak. UN usually publishes three variants, a high variant, a medium variant, and a low variant, and also a variant assuming constant fertility. Fertility meaning number of children per woman in her entire life. Um, there are some errors about that if you evaluate that in the different countries, but uh, we can assume that that is constant, nevertheless, with the given optimal numbers or the best numbers available. And then we see that we can nevertheless have three variants where the uh, United Nations assume uh, that on the one hand side there is a certain medium assumption about how fertility decreases as the people develop. A little bit stronger decrease in fertility and a little bit smaller decrease in fertility. And this then results in these three variants that are published. They are published every two years, actually, and we, can, we will have a look at that in just a moment. What one see actually, is that the medium variant levels off in this diagram at about, where is it, 10 billion people by the year 2100, and around the two year 2050, we are somewhere over here, is a little bit more than 9 billion people, 9.5 billion people, something like that. And most projections into the future are done with this medium variant actually and they are also done with these 9.5 billion people for the year 2050. 
and we see that the increase, the annual increase in world population levels off and as we are getting closer to this leveling off situation will not be becoming more dramatic so quickly as it is doing today because this leveling off. If we would be able to achieve the medium variant, clearly speaking, if people would choose to have fewer children worldwide on the worldwide average, we would reach this curve. And that, of course, would mean that already by the year 2050 we would have the maximum world population. It would only hardly increase above the value we have today. Only very little um, crowdedness on the Earth, so to speak. On the other hand, if we live with a high variant, get as many children as we like, and significantly more than today, presumably, or at least the fertility reduction per year is not as much as assumed in this medium variant, then world population will more or less increase forever and quite significantly increase, more or less beyond all bounds. One can say this is not really a feasible way for our, our, our Earth because it's hardly to foresee that the resources will be sufficient to support this huge amount of people. Okay, I said this prediction is done, or this projection is done, every two years. It's published again every two years. And what I plot now on the next slide is how the prediction for the year 2050, how that has changed over the years. And these are these so-called UN world population prospects, always projected for the year 2050, and then looking what UN published in 2000, in 2002, 2004, and so on, until to the last version, which is from 2012. And here we see now, again, as I said, for the medium variant, 9.5 billion people, roughly, that they project for the year 2050. High variant being almost 11 billion people, and the low variant, 8.5, roughly, billion people. And you see that there's a certain development. One can guess already that these uh, slopes here are positive, so the values are increasing. It appears that every two years, the, co the values projected for the year 2050 are going up, are rising. Well, here it cannot be seen so very clearly, but what I actually did, I took the data, these data, and fitted them with straight curves, linear dependencies. And I added only one additional condition, and that is, that is that the lines have to meet in the year 2050. Why is that so? Well, here there's a significant scatter and the different variants will differ significantly. But as we approach the year 2050, of course, in the year 2050, we know how many people are there. So if we do a projection here, we don't have to project anymore, we only have to count. So there's no variation between the three variants. So the three curves have to meet in one single point in the year 2050. So I assume that and assume that these data, then each of them can be plotted or can be um, described with a linear behavior. And one sees that if we do that, fit the slope, so to speak, of three, these three curves, we wind up with a prediction not at 9.5 billion people, but with 10.5 billion people by 2050. One has to discuss that a little bit. Because, of course, the United Nations, they give reasons why these values are increasing. Especially, for example, between 2010 and 2012, they state that they had to correct some of the fertility data, especially for Africa. Yeah? So there was a certain amount of ignorance before. They didn't know something about that. They estimated values, they guessed values, and obviously they had to correct for that. So there was some data simply missing, more or less, and they had to correct for those new insights, so to speak. This can, of course, also happen in the future. And what I have done is more or less empirically assuming that this is a picture of the ignorance of the United Nations and how the ignorance is developing and or is decreasing for the future, just empirically. This does not take into account that possibly the data today for the medium variant actually are pretty accurate. It may be that they are accurate, I don't know. But if I look at the historical development, I have the impression that actually the value is always uh, modified in a positive way, meaning towards more people on the planet Earth. And I just evaluate that 
purely empirically, nothing saying it about any probability, and I wind up with these 10.5 billion people in 2050. This is not to say that UN doesn't know what's going on. I should clearly say that, of course. But it gives us an impression about the uncertainty in the outcome of these predictions or protections. And we can look where this point now actually lies. If you go back to the sli previous slide, so to speak, with the three projections of United Nations with the three variants. And I plotted this point with the 10.5 billion in 2050. This is this point. And we see actually it is very close to the high variant and not so close to the medium variant everybody else is using. So we see that if we don't take care, we will wind up really at the high variant, which is of course in the very crowded state of Earth. Yeah, and we have to really see how to cope with these many people uh, on Earth. And we simply don't know how this will be developing in the future. Yeah? But it says this is really, everything is possible. And pre presumably it's more the higher variants that are possible than compared to the low variants. So it's very probable that we will wind up somewhere over here. And well, the probability that we wind up at such low values is actually not that high. Okay, now we know this. Of course, this is only half the truth. I should dwell a little bit on the interrelation of how the population increase develops with time. Because that then leads us to the next point we have to take into account. If we look at the sit a single nation and look how it develops, and this is now some time scale taken across the process of developing of this nation, then we see that if it has not been developed in a low de development state, we have a high birth rate and a high death rate, both of equal size. This means that the population is more or less constant. Population is the red curve. So death rate is the blue, birth rate is the violet, and total population is in red, which is then more or less constant. What then happens as the nation or the country develops is that first usually the death rate is being reduced. Better medical treatment, better medical care, better um, hygienic uh, situation, uh, better water supply, better nutrition. So the death rate is coming down. Yeah? And now if it looks usually, well it's usually argued you would such that the high number of uh, children is required because then from these many children some survive and they are then taking care of the parents when, when they are old. Yeah? So this is the situation here. And now we realize the death rate is going down, which means there are more children surviving. Also children are surviving. And people then realize la for only later that the, this rate is going down. They have too many children. And now feeding all these children means an additional stress for the parents. So now in the next step, the birth rate is coming down. Yeah? Until end, in the end, both rates meet at a low value, usually around somewhere between two, around two. You will see that later on. And in here again, the world population is constant or starts to get constant because actually here many young people have been produced, so to speak. They are still getting more children. And this means that also in this first period, population is still increasing. If we now look what happens actually is if the death rate goes down, then the, total then the total population will increase because there are more children, they grow up until they get their own children and this means that the overall population will increase. And if this, this will continue this trend until the birth rate has come down and even then there are many young people being born and they are then still getting their children so the, popul the population that in the country is still increasing until then finally it levels off in this fifth uh, time period so to speak. This is a so-called demographic transition and it explains why, as it is observed empirically, world, the population increases across the development quite significantly. If a country develops, it starts out with a given population, presumably not too many, and then it increases quite considerably. Because first death rate goes down, then birth rate goes down, and then it takes even some time, um, time until everything gets stable. And we know that many countries are, well, somewhere in between here or even there, which means that the, their population will 
um, we will see a significant increase in their population. So world population will increase and that's the explanation why we see on the other hand side that that depends on how the country develops. And one way for example to try to reduce this world population increase is well, for a given country to speed up the development because the sh uh, shorter the time period of this difference the lower will be the increase of the overall world population. The faster we develop people the lower the increase in the overall population of that country. It's rather important to realize that. So if we don't take um, support for developing countries serious, we will run into problems or the problems will increase. Now we look at, uh, we have seen how this happens with development. The next thing we can look at is now how the people distribute across the world. And of course we know which are the developed regions and we know which are the lesser developed regions. And we see that for example North America is 5%, each square corresponds to 1% of world population. North America is 1%, Euro Europe is 11% of the world population and these are mainly those nations that are fully developed. China is speeding up with their development, they are following right behind so to speak. This is this amount of people. India still has some way to go, the rest, rest of Asia also, and especially Africa has, to get, Africa has to go away to go. And there are already quite many squares, so a large fraction, we saw that in the numbers, one billion people in Africa roughly. And this, because they are still developing, significantly developing, will increase quite significantly in the future. So the number of squares for Africa will increase significantly during, during the next decades. Okay, and one should say, of course, keeping all that in mind, perhaps it was not such a bad idea for China to introduce a one-child policy with all the problems, all the human rights problems that actually implies. Okay, but that only a short note at the side. Now when we see that this world population looks like that, we can guess that this will increase, probably India will increase, the rest of Asia, Asia will increase a little bit, South Africa, uh, South America may also increase a little bit as these nations continue to, de uh, to develop. Now we can look at the actual development status and I don't look at that for every single uh, nation individually but on the global perspective so to speak. The development of the different countries is, is expressed for example with the Human Development Index. This HDI is evaluated by the United Nations based on different well, contributions I will just mention in a minute. What is shown here is this index which goes between 0 and 1. The HDI is sorted or the nations are sorted by their HDI and then they are plotted. Each circle corresponds in size to the overall population. So you directly see this is India, this is China and this is presumably the United, Na uh, 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 United States. Okay, so you know where these countries are. And you see that there's a quite uh, well range of development status represented by this index. I mean, don't take this index too seriously. It expresses something. Uh, and I will just mention which, what it is. It's shown here, actually. It's split up in an education index, represented, for example, or taking into account the literacy rate and the school education the GDP, the gross domestic product, that is the strength of the economy, and the life expectancy at birth for the different countries. This is evaluated for, the, evaluated for the different countries and you see now in green, blue and red the individual contributions and the overall HDI is the average value of these three indices. Each of them scales between 0 and 1 yeah, and uh, they are then average to give the overall HDI. And one can see now that actually some nations are better off in education, some are better off in life expectancy uh, as compared to the average value, and some are better off in GDP. Yeah. For example, here's one which is obviously uh, pretty high in GDP and um, pretty low in the life expectancy. This, these dots belong to each other, these are similar sized dots here. Others, they have a good life expectancy in India, for example, and education in China is uh, better than 
uh, life expectancy and econo econom uh, well, economic power, so to speak. What one also sees is that actually the trend of all these indices is similar. There is significant scatter, but the trend is similar. And so, in many cases, it may be simply sufficient to look at the value easiest to obtain, which is the GDP, yeah, which is known for most of the nations. So, instead of using HDI, you might have the idea to use GDP directly. With a different, uh, with a certain uncertainty, of course, in the information. So it is perhaps wise to average these three values, describing more overall the overall situation in that country. But you could take GDP as well with a certain uncertainty. And I will add something else to this diagram, and that is the energy consumption in megawatt hours per capita and year. So the energy consumption per person. This is scaled logarithmically, and if we do that, we see that these um, violet dots fit more or less the other dots more. The trend is very similar to what we have seen in HDI and the individual indices for the HDI. There is a certain scatter around that, but we see as countries develop, they are using more, more energy per capita. And quite significantly, yeah, you see that the developed countries they are in the range here of uh, some uh, 70, 80,000 megawatt hours per capita and year. De not so well developed countries wind up here only at some, where are we? One, two, three megawatt hours. So there's a factor of 20 or so between the countries at the lower end of development and the countries at the top end of, uh, end of development. A factor of 20 more energy in the developed countries as compared to the lesser developed countries. Quite a significant increase. This means, of course, that we have to take that into account also if we look ahead for the energy carriers, for the fossil resources that we have. It's not only that we are getting more people, but as the people develop, the countries develop, we will also increase in the per capita consumption of the primary energy carriers. And since we are moving up with quite a number of people, quite a number of nations. This means that the per capita energy consumption will increase considerably. Now, how can we quantify that? That's difficult. Uh, so one thing one does in the first step as an engineer, one plots what one has historically, the energy in kilowatt hours per capita and year, where we saw that today we are a little bit above the 20,000, and as a function of time for the past years. And we see that we have a behavior like that. Certain scatter, yeah, we see economic crisis here, for example, low energy consumption per capita worldwide. So it was, was really a worldwide crisis. We can see that directly. Then the question is, how can we project what's going to happen in the future? And what I did is actually I took a curve that goes through that, through the data, and I found that this curve, which corresponds to a 1% annual increase in per capita consumption, represents the last, well, 20 years quite well. With a certain uncertainty, certain scatter, of course, uh, but it, pre it represents the last 20 years pretty well. And in the last 20 years, for example, China has been developing and contributed significantly to that increase. We discussed that already a little bit earlier. The question now, if this is just an engineering guess, more or less, does that really, well, is, is that possible? And one can set of, uh, can compare that, of course, to certain limiting values. That's what an engineer does if he has a new model. It, he checks, or he, he or she checks, if the limiting cases are taken into account appropriately. And if you, since you want to look ahead until the year 2050, let's look where this increase winds up in 2050. This is shown in this slide, and we see that for the year 2050, we wind up at a value with this 1% annual increase, more or less exactly 30,000. Can that be? Does that make sense? Well, we learned before that the development, developed countries are in the range of 40,000 to 50,000 kilowatt hours per capita and year. And here we are still significantly below that. It's a third, roughly, of the U.S. value today. So it is quite reasonable that you wind up with a value like that by 2050. Well, it is to be expected, of course, that there will be some uh, slowing down, perhaps, in the future. But this 
extrapolation still is reasonable. Yeah? So if that is so, let's look what happens. And what happens with the energy carriers, we have looked at, at the reserves that we have. And that's done in this plot, the primary energy reserves in now I use these big numbers as well, but we have learned how to break them down. But if you look at the entire reserves, you want to e evaluate coal, natural gas and crude oil on a similar level. And this can only be done energetically. And since you want to look at the overall reserves that you have globally, we wind up, unfortunately, with these petawatt hours. So this is the absolute value of the reserves that we have. And we see actually that uh, they are decreasing and the speed of decrease is increasing. So it, the slope curves downward as time proceeds. It is we are using them up faster and faster because world population is increasing, more people are using this energy and because people are developing, countries are developing and for that the per capita consumption increases as well. If you take both things into account it slopes like that. We can compare that also to the uh, static reach which we have evaluated before we in evaluated that for the individual uh, primary energy um, pro uh, sources and here now it's the more or less overall value taking the average weighted with the uh, amount so to speak and there we see that it would uh, we would uh, have fossil energy carriers until 2090 well then everything is finished we saw that already but we see actually it's only lasting until 2060 if we proceed with our what we are doing uh, in the way we do today. 2060 is actually not so far in the future. Yeah. I still dream of being alive at that point of time. Many of you will also be living at that point still. And we see that actually crude oil, we are running out of crude oil well before 2050. And then, of course, the other two have to take up that part that was before supplied by crude oil. Then we are running out of gas and then the coal is at its end as well, also by 2060, roughly speaking. And this means, of course, the problem. This is only uh, 45 years from now. That's not that far away. And the question was actually in the beginning that we had, is that the reason why the crude oil price is increasing? Are we seeing already that we are that the crude oil is becoming a scarce resource? Do we see that already? Is that the reason why the oil price increased? This slide I've shown already in the introduction. We see that for 15 years, years it kept constant and then it increased starting around the year 2000 by 12% per year, roughly speaking. With all the crisis in, in uh, drop here, the increase quite fast increase after that and then leveling off to meet again this average curve here, this center curve with a 12% annual increase. Is that the reason for that? Well, first of all, I should give you a better impression of this exponential increase here. Man can do that by using a logarithmic scale shown here. The crude oil price in euro per barrel is now plotted logarithmically and we see indeed that the data fit very nicely this uh, intermediate uh, thick curve here and so that may be a good extrapolation then also into the future to assume that we have an annual, inc annual increase in crude oil price by 12%. Does that indicate that we are running out of crude oil? And well, some people think that is an indication of that. And actually they refer to that as peak oil described by the so-called Hubble curve, described by Mr. Hubble or first mentioned by Mr. Hubble, who actually proposed that if you look at an individual oil well, you see that the production rate increases and then levels off afterwards so that you wind up with a more or less bell-shaped curve across the lifetime of an oil well. And now if you put all the oil wells globally together, you can assume that you have overall such a bell-shaped curve as well. And that's actually what we see. Up to here we are, into the present time actually, when this diagram was plotted, we see that the overall oil production increased, leveled up, off. Yeah? And some people then project that it's going down in the future. But actually, if you have different models, and those are presented as well, it's from Wikipedia, and also on Wikipedia you find a diagram like that, again the historical data and then the projections into the future and you see that there are very different projections possible. 
some increasing more or less continually, man, some going through maximum around 2040, some dropping off quite quickly within the next few decades. So whatever model you choose, you get very different results. And the scatter or the difference between the maximum and the minimum value increases drastically as the time into which you want to project is uh, pushed forward into the future. So actually we don't know anything about that. We really don't know. We don't know if you are running out of oil. Nevertheless, some famous German newspapers already some time ago wrote in their headlines more or less things like this, the supply will be scarcer from now on. Peak oil has been reached, or has been passed even. Frankfurter Allgemeine, a very prominent uh, newspaper, peak oil, oil production has reached its maximum. So here we are at the maximum, there we have already passed it. They claim that. Now, how do things develop? And I'm an engineer, I look at the data. So I looked at the data and what I saw is this. This is again the static reach in years as a function of time. So I took every year the reserves known at that time, divided at that by the production or the mining rate of that year and then wound up with the static reach of crude oil. If the reserves would be constant, if there would be a given amount of oil of which we take something away every year, what would happen to the static reach? Then of, of course every year we take that away for that individual year. The remaining amount is reduced by that for one year, meaning that the static reach, if world population does not increase and all these things don't happen, would be reduced by one year. And actually we see such a behavior between 1990 and roughly 2000. Here is a more or less linear decrease by a little bit less than one year per year. So the static reach is decreased by 0.7 years every year. Before that many new or significant amount, numbers of new oil wells have been found that were technically and economically feasible, so that increased. But then around 1919 that came to a halt and then the uh, static reach decreased, as I said, by 0.7 years every year. So that would, is something that behaves more or less uh, as you would expect. Of course, world population increases, development increased during that time already significantly. This means still some new oil wells have been found, but it nevertheless decreased. And then by the year 2000 something happened. Suddenly the static reach starts to increase and it increases quite considerably. Yeah? Where we were here around 35 years, now we are here almost at 50 years. Yeah? Approaching the 50 years here. What does that mean? Where does it come from? Well, this correlates of course directly with the oil price. Yeah? If the price for the crude oil is increasing, then of course it is becoming economically feasible to use also resources that are less efficient to, to mine. That means resources, now in the, uh, the sp specific uh, meaning, are converted to reserves. It becomes feasible to, what, to mine what we have before defined as being resources and they are becoming reserves. So they contribute to then to the reserves and that of course contributes to the static reach. That means starting 2000 the oil price increased or 2000 something, the oil price increased. That's exactly what we observed. At the same time, the static reach increased because uh, inefficient oil fields became economically uh, um, available, economically and technically available. And of course, we know what that is oil sands uh, in Canada, things like that. All this contributes, or things like that contribute to this increase in static reach. Okay, so this actually shows that we are not running out of oil. I can clearly say we are not running out of fossil resources. There is abundance, uh, they are available in abundance actually. And one can expect that that will increase, st still increase, or at least remain constant. Only the price for the energy carriers will increase. What does that mean? Now if you look at this slide, I've promised some slide like that already, it's the overall fertility per nation in children per woman, how many children a woman gets in her entire lifetime, versus the GDP per capita 
in US dollars. Different nations are plotted again as before. The size of the circle corresponds to the population in that country. You see United States, China, India, Nigeria, somewhere up here. And well, Austria, where I'm currently living, is down here somewhere. And the uh, fertility is specified as in red now, which means, which corresponds to a more or less constant uh, number of population in that country, constant population in that country. It's a little bit above two. Some people say 2.1, some people say 2.3, some, so somewhere in this region, if you wind up here, you have a constant population in that country. And we see that there are many nations, and especially those with, which are low, with a low GDP per person, where the number of people per woman are actually significantly high. Five, six, even six, and even above that, even up to seven um, children per woman in her lifetime. And we see it's increasing as GDP is lower, or if GDP is lower. Only if you re reach here a GDP per capita of the order of 3,000 US dollars, one can say somewhere up to here, it is more or less constant, up to the uh, value of 3,000 US dollars per capita. Beyond that, it's constant, and below it increases with decreasing GDP. And that's significant. Why do I tell this? Well, the point is, these nations they are, that are rep represented by these dots, they would like to develop. For their development, they need energy. Now, energy is becoming more expensive, which means actually the speed of their de development is slowed down. And if you look at the demographic transition, actually the opposite of what would be beneficial actually happens. The speed of development is slowed down and not speeded up, as I've mentioned before. Because of that, of course, the overall population increase will increase. So the problem with the world population is getting worse. Yeah? High energy prices lead to a stronger increase in world population, directly, hence directly related. And that means, again, we should put lots of effort in developing these countries in order to speed up their development so that their population, uh, that their fertility, their, their growth rate, so to speak, comes down. I mean, still now these dots are small, but as I said, if you, if you can imagine six children per woman surviving if medical treatment is proper, that's really an explosion of population. And that's actually what is expected by these predictions that, especially in Africa, the dots will increase in size quite considerably. Okay, we have seen now a little bit about these interrelations, about lifestyle, so to speak, how much, life, uh, how much money we have available how many children we get, how we use our resources, our reserves actually, and our fossil energy carriers, and how all that is interrelated. Let me sum up what we have seen in this uh, video. The amount of the primary energy carriers is not critical. We have enough in the ground. Only the prices will increase. It will become more expensive to mine those reserves, well actually those resources that we have today, and transfer them to become reserves um, by this increasing price. But this directly means that the developing countries will face difficulties with the speed of their development and actually since that contributes to the overall world population, this is a problem for each of us, for all of us. So because they are using all the resources and the more there are, the more people there are, the more resources are used. And this means also that it's actually the world population that is a problem, it's not the energy. It's the world population by itself that creates all the problems. If you were few, fewer people, we wouldn't have those problems we face today. So with that, I have shown the interrelation between fossil energy carriers, world population and standard of living expressed somehow by the GDP per capita. Next time we then would look, want to look what happens with the fossil energy carriers that we transform to CO2 and release into the atmosphere. Thank you for now and I would be happy if you would join me for the next presentation.